And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Jeff Harmon, near-death experiencer, second-generation astrologer, paranormal researcher, and spiritual consultant with 47 years of experience. He is the only astrologer on the planet who stores his clients' records and filing cabinets given to him by the one and only George Carlin. Jeff, thanks for joining me and welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeff. Well, it sounds like you have a long history of paranormal activity in your life. Let's start from the beginning and, and how, how did this all happen for you? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I actually remember being born and I didn't want to come here. Wow. And um, I remember even the hospital delivery room walls. I can actually still see the yellow tiles. It was, it was a ceramic yellow tile. And uh, I, I can visualize it as I, I speak about this. And um, it's really interesting because when I was a little boy, I think I was probably, you know, really young five, six, something like that, maybe even younger, four, um, I had a pair of guinea pigs and they were down in a cage in our backyard, right? And I was sleeping and I had this dream that one of my little guinea pigs died and it was laying on its side exactly a certain way. And I ran down the stairs. I woke up, ran down the stairs and I opened up the door and the little guinea pigs laying exactly how I envision. So I run in, you know, I'm crying, little kid, right? And my mom says, honey, she goes, and I told her what happened. I says, I dreamt this, mom. I, I just dreamt that this has happened, and it's exactly what happened. She goes, you astral traveled. And I said, wow, what's that? You know, being a little kid, you know, you don't know what that is. She says, you astral travel. She goes, a lot of times we exit our body during the dream set. And I think we, every one of us do every single night. And we can do it in consciousness, too, if we become aware of it. And this is something we'll get into in a minute here, which anybody can do. It doesn't take a special talent. It takes special awareness and practice. But she said, I asked for travel, and I witnessed what had happened pre facto, woke up, and then there was. So, you know, we gave little guinea pig a burial and all that. And it was, you know, real emotional. You know how you are when you're a child. It's emotional when you're adults, right? I just lost a dog. That was devastating. But long story, and I got to tell you about that. My dog actually visited me. It was wild. Uh, my dog passed away here about a year ago. I loved her. Her name was Shelby. Really a great dog. And I was so sad. And I said to the group spirit, see, it's believed group spirits are over animals. They're different than we are. We, we have separateness of consciousness. Not that animals don't, but they say group spirits rule over groups of, you know, different species. And I, I actually made a prayer to the group spirit. I said, please take care of Shelby. Make sure she crosses over and she's well taken care of. Within minutes, I was in a coffee shop. Within minutes, the person sitting with me saw Shelby all around me, and so did I. And she was just jumping all around me. And I went, oh, my God. So back to the story when I was a, a little kid, that's when it started for me. And my mother was an amazing lady. I, I will always cherish her. She wasn't my mother. She was truly a friend and a soulmate in a lot of ways. And as I grew up, uh, I had a lot of paranormal experiences. Um, I actually remember entities coming in the room when I was a little boy, uh, especially sometimes when I was in an alpha state. You know? And I would talk to her about this stuff. She goes, oh, yeah. She goes, we live in a world that the veil is very thin. And it's very interesting to get into this stuff. Well, as I got older and into my teens, my mother was very much into astrology, and she was studying it quite quite a bit. She was actually a nurse practitioner, she, or not practitioner, she was a specialist in hemodialysis and was studying to be a nurse practitioner. And then she died at a very young age, at 47 years old. But during the mid-70s, uh, she exposed me to astrology. You know, I was driving and I had girlfriends and all that. And... Uh, she would always peg my girlfriends to the T, like, Jeffrey, that girl, you know, is going to be this way or that way. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know? You know? And she goes, I got their chart. And I said, what do you mean? You got their chart. And she said, well, I have their birth chart. And I said, come on. I said, that stuff doesn't work. You know, you got to remember, I grew up in northern Wisconsin. It was like Duke's a hazard up there. You know, my dad had a logging company and an excavation company. 
And, you know, I, I think I drove semis before I drove cars. <laughs> we were always working, cutting trees down and hauling lumber and stuff. So it was a very left brain linear life for me growing up. And I was really into, you know, horses and motorcycles and snowmobiles and, you know, crazy, crazy young guy like what most of us are when we're young, right? So what happened when my mother introduced me to the astrology aspect, I was really kind of like skeptical and in disbelief that something like that could happen. Cause I've heard all the skepticism, you know, Saturn has more power than, you know, the doctor in the delivery room, all these stories. Right? And she said, don't knock it until you try it first, you know, check it out. She started showing me, and this was BC before computers really came in, you know, it's the seventies or mid seventies. So it was about 1975 when I first got exposed to it. So it's almost 50 years. So what's fascinating is the more I examined it, and she started showing me why the girlfriend would be this way. You know, she would look at various different aspects and transits, and I went, oh, my God. I said, you're right. You know, this, this is very, very accurate stuff. So I became very enamored with it. And then by the late 70s, I uh, was really into it because that's when computers were coming in. The Commodore 64, the 128, and all that was on the radar screen. And we had gotten those. And, you know, those, those by the way, had less power than, you know, the corner of your iPhone or mm -hmm. Droid. <laughs> you know, the, but it, we thought we were cool with 64, you know, megabytes. Of, well, they had good what, games. Commodore, what's that? I said, well, they had good games on them. Well, yeah, I didn't play the games. But, yeah, we, we used them for... Um, Word processing and, of course, for um, the, the astrology. Mm -hmm. They were rudimentary at best. And then DOS came out. You know, Windows was just being born then, late 70s. And um, I was getting more and more sophisticated programs. And parallel to all of this was also this, you know, paranormal phenomena. And, you know, again, the astral traveling, the entities. And then I saw a lot of crafts when I was... In the 70s, my, I had a very eccentric uncle, and he bought this really expensive uh, telescope, right, with Barlow lenses and all this stuff, and he gave it to me. It was amazing. It had this, you know, wooden tripod that telescoped up and down. It's pretty awesome. So I started tracking different phenomena in the sky. Of course, we call them UFOs. Um, now they call them UAPs, right? So what's interesting is I would track these triangular craft and football shaped crafts. And this is way up in Northern Wisconsin. And mind you, you don't have street lights up there. I mean, the nearest hospital was 40 minutes away. And um, so we lived in the woods, truly. And uh, the only light you'd get is from somebody's backyard light across the lake. We live right on the lake. So I would track this stuff. And my mom totally, she says, oh, yeah. She goes, there's all kinds of stuff going on. My dad, he thought I was nuts, right? So I remember one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I said to my dad, I said, okay, you think I'm nuts? I said, get down here. So he comes down to the to the lake shore where I had the telescope set up right by the pier. And he looks in there and goes, yeah, you're right. He goes, that's uh, some pretty, pretty wild stuff. I said, there you go. Well, then the events that happened to me after that was really – Quite phenomenal. I had a motorcycle. And again, this is the 70s. And um, I was coming home from a girlfriend's house pretty late at night, like 2, 2.33 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And I was going by, I was on this really rural back road. You know, these are little, you know, blacktop roads that you can barely fit two cars down, right? And I was on a lake called Little St. Germain Lake, which is up by the town of St. Germain, Wisconsin. And I noticed this pulsing sphere. And what do I see? I look up, there's a football shaped weird craft with this really strange, almost like LED like type illumination and yellow and white and strange colors, right? Kind of bluish. And so I just kept going, I kept going along. So about another three miles, I had to go down a highway. I start hitting the lake we lived on, which was called Lost Lake. So you always descend down to the lake, you know, because the highways are usually up a little more. And um, as I got down on Lost Lake Drive, I'm going along, the bike dies, completely dies, right? And I went, okay, you know, it was, it was a fairly moonlit night, it was, I could see. And I got out, I had a big lighter at that time, you know, everybody smoked in the 70s, right? So I, I um, checked the fuse, everything's fine. And then I had a toolkit. I thought, well, you know, let's check the battery. So maybe the battery's bad, right? Arced it, nothing, flat dead. I mean, not even a spark. 
If anybody does that, you take a screwdriver and a wrench and connect them together on a 12 volt battery, you're going to get hell coming to breakfast. So nothing happened. So I figured, well, okay, the bike's dead. You know, I don't know what's going on. So I decided to push it down by a friend of mine's house. And his father happened to wake up when I knocked, you know, I was coming in there and the dog barked. And I think, you know, and then I knocked on the door and his dad came out. And I said to him, I said, hey, Mr. Laramaz, I said, do you mind if I keep this uh, uh, bike here? I said, it died. And that's what he looked up. He said, what's that over there? He saw the thing too, pulsing away above the trees. And I used to notice a lot of these crafts would go down into the woods. And I had many experiences with stuff like this up there, including strange phenomena with animals being scared and running. So pretty wild stuff. So anyways, to end this story, the next, I, he gave me a ride home, which was only a couple of miles away on the other side of the lake. So the next morning I said to my mom, he says, Hey, you know, why don't you come with me in the pickup truck? I'll load the bike in, you know, and then, you know, we can get this thing home. So she was with me and I figured, well, let me try the bike. Push the button, boom, starts right up. I said, okay. So that craft, and this is very common, many people who have, you know, experiences like this, it's like, you know, close encounters of the third kind. Electrical phenomena gets really squirrely. It's, it stops working or other types of things. So, and I've had missing time. I've been with friends. Um, I was in a musical group, again, in the late 70s. And uh, we ended up on the other side of a freeway. And I had looked at my friend. I said, uh, did, did you remember getting over here? He says, no. And he says, and it's like almost 35 minutes later. I said, yeah. I said, something really trippy is going on. And of course, I've had a lot of experiences like this. And then if you roll the clock way forward, uh, coming out here to California, I've seen some really trippy stuff. I actually saw a person shapeshift in a hallway to close to seven or eight feet tall. And he looked really weird, like an albino. I felt I felt that was in the movie, They're Among Us, you know, or, or They Live or whatever that movie was. And then I've seen people's hands shift. Uh, I had one guy I was working with on some translations of Hebrew and Aramaic, and his hand sh shifted from a normal hand to a claw. And I thought, okay, that's my imagination, right? Except he noticed that I noticed that his hand did that. And he puts his hand under the table and he became very sheepish after that. And I thought, okay. <laughs> wow. So, you know, th this has been a fun journey for me. And uh, in, in a minute, we'll get into where the ancient techniques of astrology and Nadi astrology and Vedic astrology play on this. Well, before we go there, can you quickly tell us about your near-death experience? I had a bad motorcycle accident. Uh, and this was, again, probably about 1978. And uh, I hit the front of a car. I was going down a road, and I'm watching this car, and I'm thinking, okay, she's not going to do this. And right as I get right next to it, pulls right in front of me. I did a cannon shot over the hood, and um, I broke my left ankle. And it's very strange because I remember being outside of my body and watching what was going on, particularly in the hospital. I don't remember right at the accident scene much, but in the hospital, I remember them sewing on my head. And um, I had a broken ankle, I had to get set. And then I came back into my body. And I've also had a lot of out of body experiences. Some of them are a direct intention. And see, I also do clearings of people and properties. Um, where you can do remote clearing, which is like people will complain that they have ghosts or entities or various phenomena attacking them. And uh, that's a, a subject of great interest to me, and we can talk about that later. But um, we can all learn to astral project. And what we do is you, you can actually go into a meditative state or you can go into a, uh, you can lay down or you can just sit and you can actually do what we call build an elemental of yourself outside of you. We already have one. It's called the etheric double of the aura or the auric field. And um, if anybody goes to my YouTube channel, we talk a lot about this stuff. Uh, it's a Jeff Harmon Vedic astrologer or Jeff Harmon astrologer and uh, H-A-R-M-A-N. And what's fun is you can learn to do this through concentration. And there's no time and there's no space. Everything is connected once you get into the astral planes. 
So it's very interesting stuff. It's all consciousness. And I think NDEs, as well as our ability to do astro travel, uh, are all directly connected. When we die, known as death, we don't die. Um, and that's one of the things I think the religions has sorely failed on. I think the the Catholic Church, Rome, through the doctrines of reincarnation, which were originally in Christianity, somewhere between the first and the third century, these are the bearded men murdering each other to you know, decide what Christians would get to believe. And I'm not negating Christianity at all. It's excellent, excellent uh, theologies. But I, I would say what they did is they, they, you know, you're all sinners and you're all going to hell. And we all astral travel every night when we dream. And the theory is, and you and I were talking before the show, and I love this movie. It was Robert uh, Williams, uh, the, the movie, What Dreams May Come. If people remember that movie, remember he was going down the PCH. It was actually filmed right down on the PCH, uh, the tunnel going out to uh, the along Santa Monica there. And of course, he hits this car and he, he dies and he ends up in all these dimensions. And then he has to save his friend who committed suicide. So this is stuff that is absolutely real. And that is an exceedingly accurate, I think, in some ways, depiction of what happens to us. And NDEs are absolutely reality. All these people who report this stuff, I don't believe them. I know they're right. Um, belief's not required here because we all will exit the physical body. And I think one of my favorite texts about this particular subject is a psychiatrist named Dr. Carl Wicklin. Go, get, go on my YouTube channel. We talk about this. Or I actually, on my website, jeffarmer.com, I have these books listed in the Amazon store, 30 Years Among the Dead. And the reason why, this is about a psychiatrist. In the, he was born in the 1800s, went to the Chicago School of Medicine in the early 1900s. And he did not believe in anything spiritual, didn't want to hear about anything about ghosts, did not. He was Mr. Left Brain Science, allopathic science, right? Medicine. And he was a doctor of psychiatry. And of course, anyone knows, in order to become a psychiatrist, it's a lot of work. you got to become a doctor first, then you go to psychiatry school. So, you know, it's different than a psychologist. So he didn't believe in any of this stuff. And fate would have it, he moved to Los Angeles to, at the birth of Hollywood in the, I think, the late teens or something like that of 19, you know, 1900. And he goes to a party and he meets a lady and becomes smitten with her. And I, I don't know if this story is exactly right, because I think he might have met his, his wife in Minnesota and then moved here, but it's all in the book if I get it wrong. The bottom line is he didn't believe in spiritual things until he married his wife, who was a psychic channel. And he, being a psychiatrist, said, well, wait a minute here, you know, I've got to analyze this, right? It's science, right? So what he did is he started having his wife channel people. And he would, you know, back in the teens and the 20s of last century, you didn't have a word processor, you know, or a tape recorder, you had a stenographer, right? So they were typing and shorthanding and all this stuff and recording these, very well documented. The book is fantastic, 30 Years Among the Dead. And uh, there's another book too that he wrote, it's amazing, I have it on the website. Um, long story short, he really got the message when his wife channeled someone who said to him, you're the guy who's been shocking me with that lightning. Well, Dr. Carl Wicklin was famous for shock therapy treatment, which by the way, is still used to this day. It's produced by what we call a Wimhurst generator. It's all talked about in the book. Wimhurst generators allow you to crank a wheel and it will create extremely high. This is what Tesla was doing in his lab. Remember Tesla had all the lightning around him? That's high, high voltage. And it travels on the surface of wires and metals. It doesn't penetrate. It's extremely high voltage. And he would shock these individuals possessing people out of their body. Well, when he did this, his wife took on this individual who said, you're shocking me with this lightning. And he proceeded to explain a shock therapy treatment because Dr. Wicklin ran the Los Angeles County Mental Institution for a period of time and knew every detail. He says, you had to have been there. And the guy says, well, of course I was there. You were shocking me with these probes. You know, that's what they do in shock therapy treatment. So he said, um, he said, my God, he said, this is 
fantastic. He says, you, you must be deceased. And the man, you know, said, well, I don't know about that. And then pretty soon he started, you know, cross correlating. He said, you know, he says, that makes sense. Nobody listens to me anymore. Nobody pays attention to me. And I feel like I'm trapped. He says, you must be in my patient's aura. Right. And then he got the guy to realize his condition. And all of a sudden, what does he see? Well, there's some relatives I haven't seen for 50 years. Mom, she's been dead 35 years. You know, all this stuff. So what does he do? He gets, you know, aware. He consciously becomes aware that he's deceased. And he's now able to psychically realize where he's at. And he kind of end up going off into the light so to speak. If, if people remember the movie Ghost, remember when Patrick Swayze was shot in the street in New York, that window opened up above him and then it closed? Well, that's some good writing there by the screenplay writers, because I think it's a lot like that, where when we exit the body, consciousness is everything, because you're not in a physical body anymore. And astral travel works like that, it's and also I think after death works like that. And near death experiences happen because the angels that I think hold us into these bodies actually end up saying, Your time's not done. So boom, back in the body. And then we're reconnected to the five senses. Um, I have a wonderful diagram. If if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to share. Sure. So this is one of my favorite diagrams to talk about. This is a tree of life, many, many people recognize this, but this is a custom diagram that I, I drafted because whatever your concept of God, divinity, guy in the sky, woman in the sky, whatever it is, God is above clearly all creation. And to the atheist, I say, give me a minute and see if you can relate to this. So notice there's these three words, ain, ain, saw, or, and that is believed to be outside of creation where the delight of divinity is actually, you could say, solidifying into creation itself. Now, this upper dimension here is called, that's an Aramaic Hebrew word that means absolute, which means the creation of souls. It's believed that our souls are created up here. There ain't no astrology up here, and there's no rotating galaxies up here. This is really divine stuff. They say it's outside of human comprehension. And it's so bright and so divine, we couldn't even see. And this is why many of your saints and prophets have talked about no one can see God. And it's because it's so powerful. So our souls are believed to be created here. They say there's 49 dimensions and 49 sub-dimensions here. And many people in the Western theology might recognize the seraphims, the cherubims, and the thrones. That's the first hierarchy of angels believed to rule this. The next worlds down, Briya, is known as the waters of creation. This is where you could say uh, creation becomes more and more solidified. And they claim there's many spiritual worlds up here. And there's 49 dimensions, 49 sub-dimensions here, and these are the angels ruling it. Then we get into, and many people listening may have heard of a text, if you've been hanging around the Kabbalah, um, it's called the Sefer Yetzirah. Now, what that means, Sefer just means book, and Yetzirah just means formation. So once you get past the foreign language, it just means the book of formation. And the book is about where time and space starts to happen. This is the Yetzeratic dimensions. Now, they claim there is 49 parallel universes. This is where all the rotating galaxies, the black holes, all the stuff that's going on, the amino acids, and creation in time and space are happening. This is very dense stuff. I can't balance my checkbook. I can't hardly relate to 49 parallel universes and 49 subdimensions because it's unfathomable when we think about that. And many quantum physicists, including many of the greatest thinkers and minds, have all said, this is a very likely reality. And, you know, we haven't even figured out our one, you know, universe, uh, let alone the solar system yet. So it's vast. So the last worlds, ASEA, is the worlds of action or where they claim the astral planes are. And, they, and this is where we go when we exit these meat suits known as bodies. So ASEA is a strange word that just simply means the astral planes. And notice 
beneath, then we have the earth, which is where spirit manifests, and then you have the demonic tree beneath it. And every culture on the earth, Western, Eastern, you name it, they all talk about some war in heaven. Of course, many people in the in the West will recognize, of course, the Garden of Eden story, right? Adam and Eve and the serpent and all that. So God cast down through this war in heaven the evil spirits. And you see, you know, we get a guy with a suit tie and a microphone telling us about the devil, but it's just a little bit deeper than that. This is the four that were cast down. They say it's Lucifer, Satan, Belial, and Leviathan. And there's eight sub-princes beneath this. This is really deep stuff. And I mean, this is a very rudimentary overview of this. But we tend, when we get, they actually say the guardian angel ties the spirit, psyche, and soul to the embryo at conception by silver cord. So we're not fully in it, but when you work, when a child is conceived or an animal is conceived, the spirit, psyche, and soul is attached to it, like by assignment. And the period of gestation, which for most women is about nine months, is when they say there's a lot of interaction between the, the guardian angels and the soul. And then when we exit mom's womb, boom, that's when time starts. And this is really fascinating because... There's something known, and many people know it as Vedic astrology, and you can see Vedic astrology is kind of a pop term. A friend of mine, Chakrapani, actually coined that phrase many years ago. He was a cool guy. He just passed away at 84. And its real name is Jyotisha. And back in the 60s, Chakrapani said, you know, Americans are never going to know what Jyotisha means, so we'll, we'll call it Vedic astrology. And that stuck. Jyotisha means the science of the light of the soul. So while the Western astrologers are running around busy calling everyone their sun sign, like the Linda Goodman stuff, I'm a Pisces, I'm an Aries. The Vedic and Jyotish astrologers were way past that one. They said, no, you're not your astrology. That when we exit mom's womb, that's when time and karma are synchronized. Think about that one. Think about that one. That is really deep. Time and karma is a synchronization. And it is. It is. And I, that, back to the beginning of this show, that's what I remember. I remember this. I've had clients tell me in readings, they remember standing outside of black holes. And the angel would say, you got to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go back to earth. Right? And boom, in the body they are. And I could tell you so many stories of just breathtaking examples of this. And, you know, Earth is not an easy place to be. There's no question. We all have a, our trials and tribulations here. If all of us remember our childhood, some of us had blessed childhoods, some of us don't. Um, and all points in between. I know we used to adopt some uh, children when I was growing up, and I saw how hard their lives were. It's qu quite uh, uh, jolting to have your parents give you up for adoption, you know, no matter for what reason, you know, it's, it's a very traumatic thing. And we're all here having a physical experience as spiritual beings. And I think one of the, again, I'm not here, there's great truths in a lot of religions, there's also great dogma in a lot of religions. But I would say, one of the things they sorely failed at, and I think Dr. Carl Wickland in his book, 30 Years Among the Dead, and also his other ex extremely good book, the, um, I forget the title, but I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, amazing book. It's also on my website. And, and that is that we don't die. And this is why NDEs are real. All these people telling these stories, I absolutely believe them because we will all exit the body. Instead of having a near-death experience, we're going to have a death experience. I guarantee you, you and I and everyone else listening, is going to exit this body sooner or later. Some of us will die old. Some of us will die young. Some of us will die in the front of a bread truck. I mean, however we go, we all literally will exit this body. Life is very temporary. And I think what's so elegant about, there's another book I mentioned, Freeing the Captives. This is a medical doctor who got sick and tired of the surgeries and the pharmaceuticals and said, wait a minute, 
I know there's spiritual phenomena. And she started getting into regressionary therapy, case after case, clinical documented case after case after case after case of people clearing up once she got the disincarnate removed and entities. And this is a reality. I've had literally three or four disincarnate souls get up out of my aura. And most of us, believe it or not, are probably harboring something. Um, the magnetic aura of the human being is so strong that disincarnate souls who are confused, see, there's layers around the auric field. And these layers are extremely important. See, the first one, they actually say there's five layers to the soul. The first one is what we call the etheric double. Now, different people call it different things. Another book I love to mention is The Magus of Strovolos. That's also on my website. And I talk about that a lot on the YouTube channels. So these layers around our auric field are phenomenal because they are literally layers that bring us into this physical world. And I didn't finish the story. And I want to talk about this really fast. They say when we're born, we literally are knocked out. You see, in fact, all of us may recognize, if you look in the mirror, or we all know, we have a mark right here beneath our nose and our upper lip. Some call it the mark of silence. And this is the mark they say the angel makes to knock us out. Some say it forms in the womb. Some say it's formed right at birth. And it may be different for different souls. But that is the mark of silence to mark us out or knock us out. So we can't remember our previous lives. Many people do. There's a lot of people who still remember past lives and things. We get glimpses. And this is, a, there's a great text I talk about. It's called the Shar'ar Hagilgum. This is a text that actually goes into, it's called the gates of reincarnation. See, in Aramaic and Hebrew, Shar'ar means gate, and Hagilgum means the recycling of the souls. And this is an amazing text to study uh, and be aware of, because it actually talks about how this big thick dash line in this diagram is literally the block that we have from the subconscious mind. We, we can't remember our past lives. We can go to regressionary therapists, some people can get glimpses, but we couldn't live our lives if we could see everything that was about us. You know, the, the conscious mind, they say, starts forming in the womb. And this is a wonderful model here. The so-called conscious mind is below this big thick dash line, and the subconscious mind is believed to be up here. And what's fascinating about this is the lower conscious mind is really the present personality. They say when we're, we draw first breath, this is when it really starts forming. And that everything we know from the time of birth to now is really an amalgamation of belief combined with impressions, combined with our deductive reasoning. But it's not us. And see, that's what the religions really failed on in that one sense. And Christianity tried to drive that home. If you read some of the messages in Sermon on the Mount and other texts, and you also go into the Hebrew text, the rabbinical, the Vedantic texts, you also look at some of many other wonderful cultures. They espouse these same truths. You are not who you think you are. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. So the lower conscious mind is really what I like to call the present personality. It, see, human beings will never be like AI. AI will never be smarter than us. It can't. It might de, you know, have deductive reasoning that's dangerous, but it's never going to be as smart as any of us. Why? Because we take logic and then we emotionalize it. And in Vedic astrology, they actually call the moon not only the mother, but it represents that what they call the present personality's perception of reality. Look at that here. You can actually see that. It's our emotional perception of reality. And a computer is never going to have a soul like us. Now, they'll say, oh, yeah, the computers, they get a consciousness. Yes, they do. But that's not like us. We have a spirit, psyche, and soul, and it's attached to the upper elements of the soul. The neshama is also noted 
as the blockage and karma that we immerse into in these incarnations. So this is really deep stuff, but a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And astrology, everyone thinks they're their astrology. They're not. Astrology is very accurate because it's interacting with the soul in what we call time. The earth is a time machine, and it truly, truly is. If you look at the rotation of the earth, and even for the flat earthers, you still have the celestial models going on. You have day and night, right? The moon goes around the earth every 27 and a half to 28 days. It's unstoppable. It's like a clock. So when we're tied into these bodies at first breath, that's the synchronization of time and karma, and we're knocked out. And they also say the more we incarnate, the more we will awaken. What's interesting is many souls will, are, are very awake. In other words, they've incarnated a lot of time. And this is deep, deep stuff because the earth is a time machine. It is a soul cauldron where time and karma get synchronized. You know, us Westerners, we get a little queasy when we hear that word karma. I know I did. And I still, you know, karma evokes, oh, it's got to be bad, right? It's karma. No, karma can actually be good. Some people in the West would call it merits of the soul, right? Credits of the soul or sins of the soul, whatever analogies you want to use. We tend to drag this stuff around from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. And they actually say, if we could see all the disincarnate souls, all the ghosts or, or all the spirits and the angels and the elementals around us, we probably would flip our cookies. See, we only see with the eyes and the ears and the five senses, right? And, and here with the ears. But see, the third eye chakra, which is where the pineal gland is, which is the Jupiter chakra, is what's been closed. And they say it's going to open again. As we evolve over the next couple of thousand years, and I think it'll be closer to a couple hundred more years, we're going to really start opening up and live longer. Um, there's something known as the Great Ages. Sri Yukteswar and many of your older avatars had talked about this, and that is this diagram right here. Many people have heard, you know, we're in the age of Aquarius, right? Well, I don't think we're there yet. Doesn't seem like the age of Aquarius to me. Does it to you, Jeff? Not really. <laughs> not yet. Look at all the wars still going on. Mm -hmm. Look at all the crazy stuff still going. Now, I'm not demeaning that, but if if the math is right, we might hit Aquarius in a couple hundred years from now. Um, I would look to when the Hebrew calendar runs out. That might be pretty close. See, these are the ages. They say we fell kind of into the dark ages from somewhere around the 3rd or 4th century forward. And then, right at the formation of America, which was about 1776 or the 1700s, we started moving into what they call the Bronze Age. And even though, yeah, we've got wars and a lot of mayhem, we're, we're eking back up towards the Golden Age, which they say will happen around 7,000-something-odd, you know, in, in time, 80. And... Um, you know, no one knows exactly if these numbers are perfect, but I think they're pretty accurate in general, you know, whether or not it's right to these years. But we are definitely ascending up. And in a couple of thousand years, we're going to hit what they call the Silver Age. And they claim we could have really open, the pineal gland will start opening up again, which is the Jupiter chakra right here. And we'll, the third eye will start opening up and so we're talking about Vedic astrology, as well as it appears that some of these words are Hebrew or Hebrew-like words. So are you sourcing this information from the Kabbalah or from the Vedas? Well, the Kabbalah is a pop term. The, the Kabbalah is just really ancient sacred knowledge. You know, and that got popularized. Rav Berg started the Kabbalah Center, which is great. There's a lot of good stuff there. But it's very ancient Chaldean, Egyptian, and sacred knowledge. And um, yeah, I'm sourcing it from many places. And then the Vedantic, as well as uh, many of the ancient stuff that came out of the Rig Veda, the Vedas, the Upanishads. Oh, yeah, this stuff is all over the place. You know, even the Hunas in Hawaii had this knowledge. And that is we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. And um, what's so fascinating, I think, about India and that whole Southeast Asian area is it's been less subjected 
to the trials and tribulations and wars that the West has. Not that India hasn't had its problems, but um, the ancient Vedantic stuff is pretty amazing. It really is. And so is the ancient Egyptian, Chaldean, and Hebraic stuff, which many people today call hermetic philosophy and, of course, the Kabbalah, right? Um, you know, again, the Kabbalah has been kind of you know, treated a little bit more like a religion lately, but it, there's a lot of great stuff in it the Zohar and all that, but there's many older texts in the Zohar. So yeah, there's there's a lot of places you can get this information. It's quite quite interesting. And again, you know, we, we got to remember, we don't know much. And I think the angels will, the more I get to know, the less I know I'll ever know um, until we maybe get out of this lower consciousness. Well, I noticed that almost all the dimensions were were of the number 49. What is the significance of that number? It's the number seven. It's very interesting. Look at the quarters of the moon every seven days. What's seven times four? 28. See, Saturn every seven years will go through a quadrant in a birth chart. Seven times four is 28. See, and the scientists will tell you, well, every seven years, you know, you, you, all the cells in your body's change. There's seven days of the week. There's seven holes in your head, seven halls of heaven, seven inner planets where time starts from Saturn. And so seven is a very sacred number. Many quantum physicists are focused on the number 11. They talk about 11 dimensions, which is fine. And I think that's kind of hitting the wall right now of where they can go. And, uh, but I can tell you if, if these ancient texts are correct, I, I believe the 49 and the 49 is correct, meaning 49 dimensions and 49 sub-dimensions. So, How do you get disincarnate souls to leave? Ah, not, not easy. Uh, some of them, in the, in the ancient Hebrew, they used to call them maziks, or um, some people call them dibukes. They're really, some of them are very angry. Um, I did a clearing in New York not too long ago, um, where the psychic had gone in, the owner of a business had told me, wow, we got some really weird paranormal phenomena happening, right? So I said, wow. So I use astrology. It's called interrogation astrology. Many people will know it as horary. And, you know, again, the religions have demonized astrology. It's work of the devil, right? No, it's not. It proves God, actually, especially the ancient stuff. So I cast a chart, which is called an interrogation. And I was able to evaluate, wow, you got a disincarnate soul there, which means a person who's deceased and still living in the lower astral planes. <clears throat> and the owner of the building, uh, she said to me, or not the building, but the a business had said to me, can you clear it? I said, well, I don't like clearing this stuff a lot because it's, you know, it's dangerous. You, know, you feel like a Q-tip in a mud puddle when you work on some of this stuff. And I agreed to do it. And I pick what we call an electional time to do it. It's very interesting. You have to have the moon separating from malefics and applying to benefics when you do clearings like this, or ideally you do. And I did a clearing and I went astrally there and I found this was a really angry, mean guy who had died of a drug overdose. This was a bad dude. He would not leave. He, for some reason, felt that that dwelling was his place to stay. And he wouldn't listen to reason. Didn't, I don't even think he knew he was dead. And you'll, you'll hear a lot of your advanced practitioners will say, oftentimes you literally need to build an astral jail, so to speak, extricate them and shove them off into like almost a little prison in the astral world until they realize that they have to change. Um, and this is very mysterious stuff. Suicide victims. Um, I've had clients who've committed suicide and they've come back. I had one come in on me not too long ago and they actually were in my aura. It was really made me sick. And I, I, I told them, I said, you have to go. You have to, you know, go move on with your evolution. And these angels will take them away. And there's, there's what they call secret helpers, or you could say helpers on the astral plane. In fact, if you read Dr. Carl Wicklin's booklet and some of these other doctors, they'll say the same thing, that they actually had help to, and angels or spiritual helpers take them away. A lot of times they're disincarnates who've advanced to helping the human race. Uh, many people who studied the Rosicrucian documents, I don't know if you ever heard of the Rosicrucians, but Max Heindel and, of course, Christian Rosenkrut from the Middle Ages, 
uh, had a wonderful body of knowledge. You know, the Masons knew about this stuff, the older Masons, and uh, it's still in modern Masonry. So there's a lot of, you know, hermetic philosophy, and, and this, this is all well known. Pythagoras talked about this incarnate souls. You know, so many ancient cultures knew about this stuff, and they would do rituals to help them move on and prayers, which is what we'd call them today. But that particular instance in New York was a rough one because that was a nasty dude. And he, they, they become completely complacent. They don't want to change. They, they like where they're at. They're sucking off vampirically the etheric energy of people and the locations. That's how they stay on the lower astral planes. I had another situation a number of years ago. There was a, a woman who contacted me and she, her husband was a judge and I won't mention where, but, um, she said, and the husband too, the judge, actually, um, I met with him and he said, you know, he said, I don't believe in this stuff, but he said, I got to tell you, he says, we've had seven maids quit our house because they have this weird poltergeist stuff happening and they hear this moaning outside, right? So I, again, did an analysis of it a couple of different ways and particularly with astrology. And I said, yeah, I think you've got a disincarnate soul here that's been here a long, long time. And uh, I started doing research on the property and found out that many years ago, back in probably the 30s or 40s, it was a brothel and that um, this woman had been killed. <clears throat> and I think she probably got pregnant and they threw over a cliff or something. And she was dwelling in this property area and uh, particularly that house. And I think it had been rebuilt since, you know, that. And um, so I, I said to them, I said, well, I said, the only way I'm going to get this done is, is if, you know, you guys don't mind if I can get in there by myself. And they agreed to go to a hotel and the judge actually gave me a written piece of paper in case something happened that I had clearance to be there. And so I went in there. I actually had to use nitric acid, which you can't get anymore because, you know, after 9-11, that'll stop. But you put dishes of it out and it clears the etheric vapors in the room and the areas. And then you got to be very careful about stuff because it, it can eat through things. You got to put it in ceramic. Anyways, long story short, um, I found that this girl, literally, she was um, unaware. And I think she was very remorseful. Um, I think she knew she was pregnant. And that was another reason, you know. So again, you know, these women of the night don't realize how bad of a business that is. Uh, one of the oldest businesses in the world and um, very violent stuff. And uh, the only way I could get her to go was to take get her taken away. Uh, I actually had some angelic help, if you will, to like bring her away. It was the only way it would happen. Well, people listening to this story might go, well, okay, sure. You know, he says this. Well, here's the interesting thing. It cleared up, just like the place in New York and many other stories I could tell. They clear up afterwards. You know, and scientists and naysayers always go, well, this stuff is a bunch of hogwash, right? Just like UFOs. And I always say, well, when you get a result, isn't that proof? You know, and especially if it happens more than once. And, you know, you have to be very humble with these things because they're dangerous. I, I have actually cleared people and gotten fevers of like 102. It's, it's, it's not something I like to do, and it's something I'm very cautious with. And you'll find many people out there do this stuff. And some of them will use Christian methods. They'll use Hebrew methods. They use other types of methods. And whatever works, I think, is what you believe. And again, I think the religions have failed in teaching us how powerful we all are. You know, uh, for many Christians listening, you know, it was said right in Sermon on the Mount, what I do, you can do, and greater. Uh, I think that is so true. If we take away the ego and just really study this stuff, um, again, I have a, a wonderful suggestion of the Magus of Strovolos is about a healer who lived in the city of Strovolos. That's on my website, too. And we talk a lot about that on the YouTube channels. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun to be aware of this stuff because we're all <clears throat> going to exit these bodies. And I think the more conscious awareness we can get of that, the more we're going to approach that day when it all comes for all of us with a much greater conscious awareness. Well, what do you it's so important? What do you think is the best way to prepare to exit the body? I think reading texts, you know, I mean, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do, and uh, we're all where we are all 
are at, you know, in terms of our awareness, beliefs, and acceptances. And, you know, I think it, it helps to read books like 30 Years Among the Dead, The Mangus of Strovolos, Freeing the Captives. The Unquiet Dead is another wonderful book by Dr. Edith Fiore. And there's many others out there. But these are some of my more favorites that I've read over the years. And what it does is you read these books that are very well you know, written. And this isn't just somebody channeling, you know, arbitrarily and flipping tarot cards. Not that I'm demeaning that, but but it, it, these are clinical doctors who have left the left brain allopathic worlds and really addressed what works. And I think Dr. Carl Wicklin's work is stunning because he actually started the Psychical National Research Institute in 19... I think it was 1920 something in Los Angeles. It's not doesn't exist anymore. And um he wrote uh the book, I, I forget the name of it now, but it's the um I, I just talked about it on my last podcast. Sorry, I'm blanking out. But what's so good about this book is he actually has transcripts of the dialogues of disincarnate people with his wife channeling it. And Every one of them, the patients clear up. This is a, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a licensed psychiatrist that would have people with schizophrenia, multiple per personality disorders, missing time, delusions, all these things that the insane asylums would give up on. He would take them into the National Institute of Psychic Research, and he would dislodge the spirits using the Win Wimhurst generator, meaning the shock therapy treatment, which is still used by some today. And it really works because spirits don't like that. It, it really, we can take it, but the disincarnate really freaks out and they jump out of the body. There's also methods you can do it through prayers and certain banishing techniques that are very good. So he would then have his wife take them on and he would have dialogue with them. And I mean, this is not some theory. This isn't some wild idea. This is literally clinically documented cases where these people would realize their condition. And the stories are phenomenal. I mean, I couldn't, we don't have enough time here for me to go through all of them, but read these books. And I think just that alone, you see, you got to remember our lower conscious minds are an amalgam of what we believe versus what we feel versus what we use in deductive reasoning. And all of us are different. Psychology is a deep subject. When you look at the human mind, all of us are rationalizing, right? We all got our logical, rational mind. And then some of us are intuiting. But in the end, it all gets thrown in the hopper of we emotionalize it. You see, we we come to some conclusion. We got to get onto our life, right? We got to sleep, got to go to work, got to do whatever we do. So it's really important to analyze your belief systems. And I, when I hear somebody say, well, I believe, I always get a little nervous. It's like, well, I don't know what I believe anymore. I'm more just a student of life and, and just trying to observe what's coming at me. And the more I concretize my belief, the less I'm open to other things. You know, I've, I've had a chance to work. I had a studio back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I worked with a lot of religious organizations. I actually worked with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I got to work with George Carlin. It was fun. I did all kinds of stuff. And um, it was fun to observe these people, how concretized they are in their belief systems. I think that's one of the reasons everybody liked George Carlin so much is because he'd use humor to reflect on the insanity and irony of the human race. <laughs> he would bust on us. He made us laugh. And he was such a genius. I love George. I, I got to record him in the studio. What, a, what an amazing guy. He was. And I know a lot of times people say, well, he's very vulgar. Yeah, well, he is, but that's that's comedy, right? So it was um, such a, a blessing to have worked with him. And when he died in 08, I was really sad. I called the office. I said, oh, oh my God. I said, what happened to him? Heart attack, you know? And, um, you know, what are you going to do? We're all going to go. Now, people may or may not have figured it out, but I've had your wife on, Camille Harmon, or Camille James Harmon, right? And um, we talked about UFOs and her experiences. How did you two meet? At a gas station in Malibu. <laughs> now, gas station doesn't sound too sexy, right? But Malibu, I guess it works. Right? So 
I had been going out with different girls at the time. This was the nineties. Right. And, um, I was on my motorcycle and I always like to run the canyons late at night. This, they can say what they want about California, but if you go drive a motorcycle in the canyons, you'll see how beautiful this place is. It's stunning. Love it. The ocean and all that. So I was out in Malibu cruising around out there by the snake and all that. It's a special road that a lot of people come to. And I was getting fuel on the PCH at a gas station. And I noticed there was this little convertible that had a bumper sticker that says, I love England. And I looked over and there she was pumping gas. And I said, um, what part of England? I don't know what made me say that. She goes, oh my God, the crop circles. And I said, oh, the crop circles. I said, yeah. And she knew Jim Delatoso. She knew all these people in MUFON, Dr. Lear and all this stuff that I knew because uh, I was doing a lot of research in that area too at that time. And uh, so we hit it off, you know, and we changed cars. I never thought another thing of it. You know, I wasn't hitting on her or anything. And uh, I think about a month or two later, the phone rings. Hey, it's me. Remember that girl at the gas? I said, yeah. So we met for coffee. And of course I had her astrology. I had my laptop with me. So I cast her chart and I looked at her location astrology and I said, what the heck are you doing in Los Angeles? And she said, oh, it's been horrible. I said, yeah, that's a bad place for you. She had a Saturn lion here and a Mars and a Uranus and all that. She's still here, but um, not easy for her. It's a lot of, a lot of challenges. But, you know, again, it's just energy. And when you know about it, you can change it. So that was it. And then um, we just got together. And uh, then I noticed she was in a baby making period. We got along and I said, hey, let's have a kid. And so, you know, got married and had a kid. That's and uh, that's where we're at. That's great. According to astrology, what do you see in our near future? I think a lot of chaotic transformation. Um, when you look at the United States, I mean, right now, many people are concerned. We're in an election year. We're seeing one candidate be charged with all kinds of lawfare. We're seeing, you know, our commander in soiled briefs literally doing crazy stuff. The border is flooded. We see George Carlin had it right. Forget the politicians. You have owners. And the owners who really are the people controlling the money, I think Rothschild said it best. He says, you give me control of the money, and I don't care who makes the laws. And this is really the the man behind the curtain, if you will. And um, what's interesting is Toto, the dog that pulled back the curtain, is really our awareness of this. You know, you you really, George was right. It's a big club and we ain't in it. And they beat us over the head every day telling us what to believe. So we're at a crisis point by what we call mundane astrology. Mundane astrology is a kind of a fancy word that just simply means what's going on in the cycles of the world. And we had a really powerful cycle uh, happen in 2020. I remember I was on coast to coast back in, I think, 2010 or 2011. George Norrie said, Jeff, what do you think of the Mayan calendar? And I said, not a single thing. I said, I'm really worried about 220 forward because this is a crisis point forward where the human race is really going to have to come to grips between a lot of good and evil. And of course, it manifests in many different ways. I mean, we're seeing it all over. Look at the crime. Look at the flooding of the borders. Look at the stuff going on, the climate change stuff. You know, and I really believe, not to get political here, but the climate change stuff is a lot more the sun than it is farting cows and SUVs, um, though the propaganda will tell you otherwise. And the sun cycles are, this is called the grand solar minimums. So we are at a time right now where, Again, the convulsions of good and evil are really coming together. And this, one of the biggest, uh, I think, countries in the uh, crosshairs is the United States. They, uh, this country will either be destroyed as we know it, or it's going to be the phoenix rising out of the ashes after this election. And it may hopefully be the phoenix rising out of the ashes. But, you know, again, everybody I speak to, astrologers, random, you know, generator, cliff high, they all say they're seeing something really huge coming up this summer. And that's exactly what the astrology says. It's what I've been saying on my newsletters and also on my podcast. Um, and that is that we have a second Pluto return. We have some really powerful progressions happening on the United States birth chart. Furthermore, we have this really malefic conjunction happening in the middle of July this year. 9-11 happened exactly 
on a Saturn-Pluto opposition. COVID happened exactly on a Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Can't make this stuff up. This isn't, you know, my doing or anything. If anyone wants to observe the astronomy, which is really what astrology is, you will see the cycles are so accurate, they're creepy. And uh, there's no question we are in a very challenging time. So look what's going on right now with Russia and, and Ukraine. And, and of course, what we, what we have in the Middle East, we have a powder keg there right now again. Uh, you've got, you know, Israel and Iran rattling sabers, as well as, you know, Hezbollah now, not just Hamas. So it's, it's a very, very tumultuous time. And this happens every 84 years. The last time it happened was right when World War II, Hitler was attacking France, the fall of France. All I talk about this on the newsletters. So um, this is a challenging time. But we'll get through it. We're all just here having a, an experience. And I believe good always wins in the end because good is where everything comes from. Evil's put here to juxtapose creation, you know, and uh, evil will never win. It causes a lot of trouble, but it can't ultimately win. Mm, that's great. They say everything on this planet will be born, it will grow, it will mature, and it will then experience atrophy and die. And I don't care if it's the human kingdom, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom, or the animal kingdom, it all goes through that. And even the earth itself goes through tumultuous changes over the 12,000-year cycles, that are, or 26,000-year cycles, actually. It's about 25,900-something. That's the journey of the solar system around the great central sun. So this stuff never stops, ever. Creation never stops. And that's the real divinity of this place. The earth is the place where spirit manifests. Well, if people want to find out more about what you're up to, you have a YouTube channel and it's called just your name, Jeff Harmon or what? Yeah, Jeff Harmon Astrologer, H-A-R-M-A-N Astrologer, yeah. And I'm working with a wonderful partner of mine, Ella. She's, she's uh, so phenomenal to help me on all this stuff. And uh, we're actually working on a show right now that's going to be bigger than this one. But this is really great because we talk a lot about, about spiritual things. And what is astrology? What isn't astrology? And how it's an interactive consciousness to the soul. And see, that's ancient astrology was all about that. And, you know, once we started getting into the early 1900s and the 1960s, it all got watered down into, hey, baby, what's your sun sign, you know? And that's a lot of love, light, and cluelessness. Not that there isn't some vague accuracies to it, but the ancient stuff is amazing. Um, I am really blessed. I do readings every single day of the week, and um, I have a lot of clients that I do electional astrology for, for real estate elections and surgery elections, all kinds of stuff, and interrogations. And of course, I do readings. And, you know, if people are interested, they could go to my website. It's Jeff harman.com you know just J just jeff and then h-a-r-m-a-n.com and um the email is jeff at jeffharman.com and um you know it's it's really been a blessing for me to look at astrology and people's lives i actually have a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists that are clients and we just have a wonderful time speaking about all this stuff and it's amazing to look at the cycles in our lives this is it we're all sojourners here in these bodies for a temporary time. Even though we look at our jobs, our lives, our relationships, all this stuff, it's heavy. It's not easy being on earth. And what's so fascinating about Nadi astrology, which is a branch of Vedic astrology, spelled N-A-D-I or N-A-A-D-I, and amazing, the cycles within this. And location astrology, too. I do a lot of Location. When I do personal readings, I have a package that you can get your Vedic and Nadi astrology, your cycles, and also location astrology. And I prescribe gemstones. I, I also make gemstones for people, gemstone talismans, which are amazing. Helps with people's energy a lot. And you'll see that if you guys go to the YouTube channel. You can subscribe. We we right now we're coming out with a show every Monday, once a week, and we're going to be changing that soon. And uh, it's going to be a really exciting show. We're going to have a lot of guests on it, all kinds of stuff. So. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? My last newsletter and podcasts have been about 
the crisis situation that the world's been in since 2020. And, you know, when we look at uh, one of one of the things I just came out about is every 84 years, the planet Uranus ingresses into the sidereal constellation of the Pleiades, also known as Taurus in the sidereal zone. And this always brings a lot of chaos and change and wars. In fact, the last time it happened was World War II. The time before that was the Civil War. The time before that was the Revolutionary War. The time before that was when the uh, the monarchies were falling in Europe. And uh, it's absolutely breathtaking. So the United States is going through a Pluto return right now. And well, that is when empires are either destroyed or they rise out of the ashes. And we are at a real crisis time, I think, in a lot of ways in the Western world and in the Eastern world. And, you know, people are really having a rough time right now, not only financially, all the crazy inflation and everything, but... I think the positive message out of all this is if we realize that we're just here experiencing all that we experience, no matter how good or traumatic it is, it changes our perspective on things. And we become the voyeuristic observer while still engaging in life without maybe as much dramatic reaction to it. It doesn't take away all the stuff we've got to deal with, but I, I really like that. Uh, I think it has a... Uh, a better thing. And just remember, we're all divine spirits having a physical experience. And nobody dies. Nobody dies. Uh, and, and look at some of this work. I think it's some of the most important work ever published is what Dr. Carl Wickland published. And he doesn't get the credit for it. And these other doctors, Dr. Fry with Freeing the Captives and Dr. Edith Fiore and many others. This is a profound thing. And uh, that's what struck me when I first started studying Vedic astrology many years ago. I had many teachers that were stunning. A lot of them aren't alive anymore. And uh, I was just really blown away with that whole theology that, hey, this astrology is affecting you. It's not you. You have free will. You see, that's where the religions were right. We all have a conscience. We all know what good and evil is. And it's really important for us to experience and yet not get too wrapped up in the experience, <laughs> you see? Jeff, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you for having me as your guest. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.